So today is Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Uh, I mean, one of the most fascinating people uh, in terms of his life and his ideas and the way how he reasons. He is a provocative, right? Uh, a provocateur and, and uh, uh, an extraordinary genius in more than one way. Um, there are few people whom I disagree so strongly than in many propositions of Jean-Jacques Rousseau that there are four people, few people, who turn my mind up, up uh, to own so much that Jean-Jacques. So who was this character? And let me just give you a very brief uh, overview. He was born in Geneva, which was a city-state at that time, uh, ruled by Calvin uh, for a while, a Calvinist stronghold. And we will talk about this when it comes to Max Weber and the Protestant ethic. Calvin ruled Geneva with an iron hand. That's where he was born. His father was Isaac Rousseau. He was a watchmaker and a Calvinist. Uh, well, he did run into some trouble. I don't know exactly what the trouble was. I think he was in debt, so he jumped the boat and went to Istanbul, disappeared. We don't know much about him beyond that. So, uh, at a very early age of 10, he was a kind of orphan. Then in 1728, he moved to France. And there was a wonderful lady, uh, about 10 years his uh, senior, Mrs. Warrens, who was running a home. Um, there are actually more seats over here. You know, and uh, there are... Um, uh, VIP seats right here, so you can come in here, right? This is specifically reserved for you. There are four seats here, right? And there are six and six over there. Don't be embarrassed, right? You still can see the PowerPoints from here. It's not like in a bad movie that when you sit in the front row you don't see anything. Anyway, so he met uh, Mrs. Warrens, who was a, a, a Roman Catholic, and her mission was to convert, right, these uh, um, Calvinists to the proper faith, Roman Catholicism, and took uh, young boys into her home. But who knows, it looks like she had more interest in people rather than religion. So, uh, um, he arrived 28 to Anansi, right? Age of 16, good-looking, nice guy. Uh, Madame Warren is still a younger lady. Here you can see, you know, uh, uh, Madame Warren and Jean Jacques. Right, meeting in 1728, very romantic stuff, right? Uh, uh, well, uh, yeah, and here, well, another picture, you know. Uh, well, I don't blame Jean-Jacques, right, at the age of 16, uh, to convert to Roman Catholicism, right? from the cold Calvinist religion, and meanwhile, uh, being a bit romantic, right? Well, Jean-Jacques is one of those few people uh, who wrote a confession, very funny book. He has a sense of self-irony and self-criticism, whether this is genuine or he thought this will be the way how to sell the book, hard to tell but it's worth reading. It actually was published posthumously. And he said, uh, Madame de Valence shaped his character. Undoubtedly, she did. Um, 
And this affair, affair, who knows, but it looks like it was an affair, fascinated people uh, later on. Um, uh, I think I already cracked this joke in the introductory lecture. This wonderful French writer, Sandal, in his superb novel, Le, Le Rouge, uh, et la Noire was inspired by this interesting affair, right? A 16-year-old boy and 28-year-old uh, woman. And in fact, the story of Julien Sorel, means Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and Madame de Renal, de Valence, uh, is really the core of the story. So if you have not read Le Rouge uh, et la Noire, this is a must for an Ivy League graduate. You don't want to get a degree from Yale not having read Stendhal uh, Le Rouge uh, et la Noire. It's of course in English. Then, but you know, enough is enough. Uh, in 42, several years later, um, Rousseau has uh, now bigger aims, uh, and he moves to Paris. And he becomes the secretary of Comte de Montagu, who is a French ambassador to Venice. And there are a lot of nice things about, uh, interesting things about Rousseau, but he was not an easy um, and not, not an easy guy. And somehow, he always ran into trouble. So he ran into trouble in Venice, and in order to avoid arrest and trouble, I don't know exactly what he did, probably something financially not quite correct. He had to jump and leave Venice and come to Montaigu. Uh, he moves to Paris, and he knows how to find good friends. He also will know how to make great enemies from his good friends. So he meets uh, Diderot, and we already know Diderot, and we know already Encyclopédie and the French Enlightenment. Um, and uh, uh, he was asked to write an article on music from the Encyclopédie. And this is Diderot. Um, okay, and then he meets Thérèse Lavasseur. He was staying in a hotel, and Thérèse Lavasseur was a maid in this hotel, and a long-lasting relationship develops between the two, which, well, I already told you, don't worry if you don't marry instantly. He was not married instantly either. Uh, it took him some time to decide that this date uh, should actually culminate in a legal marriage. Um, she became a companion for all of his life. Uh, uh, well, I would not bet my life that she was, for the rest of life, the only woman in her, his life, but certainly uh, she was uh, his companion. I don't know about her. Uh, they married in, uh, in 68. So you can see it took some time uh, for Rousseau to say, well, this is something which should end up in a marriage. And here is a okay, you know, here you can see them, right? There is Jean-Jacques. Uh, well, I hope you don't mind. I show you these pictures. They don't tell all that much. Well, Jean Jacques, as I said, was an extraordinary genius. He is not only a philosopher, not only a social scientist, not only a scientist. He was writing on science as well. He was an artist. And well, you know, anybody can write a novel, right? I am sure half of this class considered 
at one point in your life that you will write poetry or you will write a novel, right? That's easy. You, you, you sit down and you write a novel. My life is a novel, right? Most people say that. But Jean-Jacques wrote an opera. Probably few of you consider to write an opera, right? That needs skills, right? And he did one, Le Devin du Village. I own a CD. It's a wonderful opera. He's a great composer, right? Uh, well, that's quite unusual. And to make it even more interesting, he was in an intense debate. He was always an intense debate with everybody. But he was an intense debate with Rameau. And those of you who are a little familiar with music, you know Rameau. Rameau was the greatest French composer of the 18th century. And they had a big debate because um, Rousseau believed uh, in the Italian opera, right? Um, he, he believed that the melody should have uh, precedence over harmony. And Rameau um, want, wanted to create a French opera in which, you know, um, um, melody is not so important, and in fact, uh, um, the harmony is more important. It was a revolutionary break. Um, uh, Rameau takes, you know, creates a new space for the new music. In some days, he beginning to pave the way what we eventually will know as modern music. An extraordinary composer. Well, and Rousseau believed in Bel Canto, Pavarotti. I know, of course, there was no Pavarotti at that time. But you know what Bel Canto is. Ave Maria, right? You cry, you, cry, you can sing it, right? That's what he really believed in. Um, unlike uh, Rameau, who was much more analytical, right, and em emphasized uh, harmony. Interestingly, uh, the person whom I think is the greatest composer of all history, uh, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, loved Rousseau. And he wrote an opera, but can be very rarely seen, seen. Occasionally you can catch it in the Metropolitan Opera of Arts once in a decade. Bastien and Bastienne is actually inspired by Le Devin du Village. Go on Amazon.com. You can buy Rameau. You can buy uh, Bastien and Bastienne. And you can buy Le Devin du Village. And you can see the differences. And he, of course, publishes a novel. He just, uh, which had Julie and, uh, or The New Heloise, which at that time was an influential novel. I don't think too many people read it today. Well, this is Rameau. And he is, Rameau foreshadowed modern music Gluck, in particular, uh, uh, follows uh, from Rameau. In fact, you know, Mozart will be changing in his lifetime. Um, they will talk, well, <laughs> yeah, just, I thought, I, if there is a musician, you can read a little of Rameau. Yeah. Um, and interestingly, you know, Mozart uh, um, did not stick quite to the op uh, Italian opera over his life. Um, uh, you um, um, probably heard Zauberflöte, the magic flute, is the first German opera. Uh, the earlier Mozart is very much Italian opera. Later in life, Mozart tried to create 
German opera, which has some similarities uh, with the French music. Not quite, because it is more romantic. Okay, he is also a philosopher, scientist, political theorist, I also would say sociologist and uh, political scientist. The first piece of work uh, is actually science, art, uh, and uh, study of society. And uh, then in uh, uh, 1755, he writes a very interesting book. If you have spare time, read it, Discourse on the Origin of Inequality. Uh, again, very provocative book. Uh, in some ways, uh, it, there is some uh, sort of Hobbesian idea behind that. He said, um, well, it starts with love, but if you are really in love, well, um, you tend to be jealous, right? If you are deeply in love, passionately in love, then you don't like that the person who is the object of you, your love may have a love in somebody else. Then you are jealous. And the idea is this is the origins of inequality, right? We are jealous, right? There is one precious good, to put it with hops, right? The old desire, and if somebody else desires it as well, and has a shot at it, to get it, then we become jealous, right? We want to grab it, we want to monopolize it, so this is the source of inequality, right? Well, interesting idea, right? Uh, have you ever experienced that? Did you have occasionally a little sense of jealousy in you? And thinking, no, this other one should not have the one I do have. I think you probably did. I did. Okay. And then comes the big year, 62. He publishes two major books in one year. Two big scandals. Social Contract and Emil, and I will talk to Social Contract today, and Emil. Social Contract is really a culmination of the contractarian argument. Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau with some extraordinary important new innovations. Right? Um, as we have seen, uh, right, uh, in the first contractarian, Hobbes had a somewhat limited idea of social contract, probably realistic, uh, but not what you necessarily like. He said a social contract is not something what you concluded with the authority, right? Social contract, what you entered by and social contract which was done previously before you wanted to have a new contract is binding on you, right? Locke tended to see that social contract as sort of between the individual, right, and the commonwealth. Uh, this is a nice idea, right, that you are bound by a contract you signed. But, you know, um, those of you at least who were born in the United States never signed a contract to accept the Constitution. I am a naturalized citizen. You can say I signed a contract. Right? I had to swear allegiance to the United States. At that time, I was supposed to read the Constitution. I have not read it from cover to cover. But anyway, I signed a contract somewhat unseen, you know, suspecting what the contract is I'm signing. But most of you, right, born in this state, never signed a contract, right? It's still binding on you, right? Unless you decide to abandon the U.S. citizenship and become a citizen of North Korea, right? Then you are bound, right, by the social contract. So that, that is, you know, the difference between um, um, 
uh, uh, Hobbes and Locke, as we discussed. Now, Rousseau, as we will see, adds new, uh, new, new interesting element. He said, well, in, it's not quite the individuals. And he introduces the notion of general will. There is a general will which is well above uh, the individuals. Extremely important idea has a degree of um, insight and realism. It's also a very dangerous idea. Totalitarian regimes very often advocated general will that you, and I will quote uh, um, Jean Jacques for you when he said, the individuals will have to be forced to be free. That follows from the idea of general will. Well, he is a complex thinker. Liberal in one hand, a contractarian on the other, other hand, and paves the road to totalitarianism. He was loved by many liberals, and he was loved by many totalitarians, like Karl Marx loved him, and like Vladimir Ilyich Lenin loved him because of the general will. But Durkheim loved him too, and he was a liberal. So, uh, that is. Emil, I will talk about this. I already mentioned any one of you, and there are probably a few people who will end up in education, you have to read this book cover to cover. There is no modern education theory without the book Emil. This is the foundation of modern educational theory. Okay. He had a big impact, a big impact on the American Constitution and the French Revolution, one of the path breaker on, 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 on the French Revolution. He was also the first who advocated popular sovereignty, um, um, uh, the abolishment of the third estate and creating one popularly elected body, right? Strong conflict with Montesquieu, who wanted to have, right, two chambers, uh, one for the aristocracy and one for the people. Uh, Rousseau wanted to have one. Universal suffrage, except for women. But he was a mere chauvinist, big in one way. Well, and as we will see, the idea of general will were picked up by the radicals of the French Revolution, uh, the Jacobins and was picked up by later communists of various types, be it Leninist or Maoist. Now, the general will and French radicalism led to bloodshed. Uh, Robespierre, uh, the major disciple and believer of general will, his head was also chopped off. Uh, so much about it. Now, uh, Rousseau did not live the French Revolution. His ideas did and informed it. He had to move in 62 in exile because both books created an outrage, particularly by the church. First he went to, back to Geneva, but figured out he doesn't like Gen Geneva any longer. So David Hume, the conservative philosopher who admired his work, invited him to come uh, to England, and like with everybody else who was his friend, right? He had uh, a fallout uh, with David Hume. <laughs> he was really a difficult guy, right? Uh, this is David Hume. And therefore he left England and he returned to France. Uh, lived for a long time under an assumed name to make sure he doesn't get into trouble. Finally, 68, he married Therese. Uh, we will talk about this Emil. They have several children, and the greatest educational theorist who tells you how to raise children, he put all of his children 
in orphanage. She was a real bastard, right? To put it in other way. Um, and then he was writing his confessions, uh, um, which was published uh, posthumously. And he died in 78, uh, July the 2nd. So this is the author we will be discussing today, and we will be also discussing uh, uh, Tuesday. And I hope I will have enough time uh, between I get home and before the limo comes so I can put this on the internet. So you can read this on the internet. And this is, if right, the social contract. Yes. Social contract. 1782, and I don't know why, but I'd like to show you the first editions. Uh, doesn't take me too much time to find it on the internet, but occasionally it does. Okay, so what is the social contract is all about? Uh, book one uh, is uh, a description how you move from natural right, from the state of nature to political right. <coughs> Um, uh, the second book is who is the sovereign and how the sovereign should be constructed, created. This is an issue which uh, Locke did not pay much attention to, right? Um, 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 we will see, you know, Rousseau himself likes elected, uh, selected aristocracy. Uh, but he beginning to think about universal suffrage and uh, a proper constitution of the sovereign. Then he has a big section on government, um, uh, a section on ancient Rome and civil religion. I will talk, well, I don't have much time, I will try to talk about civil religion as well. So what are the major themes? One question is, what is legitimate rule? And he said rule is only legitimate when it is uh, 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 arrived at consent. But, he said, justice has to be diluted because general will has to prevail. I will have to talk a little about justice being diluted. The problem is there is no universal justice what you can arrive at from the individual will. There is a general will, right? A, a conception of the common good and the individual, whether the individual is done justice to, it has to be diluted, it has to be restricted by the demands of the collective will, of the collective good. Now, this is a provocative statement. It certainly has a kernel of truth. It's also a very dangerous argument because it opens up the rule for a totalitarian state which will tell you, oh, you think this is your interest? What you think is your interest is not really your interest. Me, the sovereign, knows what is in your interest and I will force you to be free. I will force you to understand, right, what is in your interest. That is a bit of a tricky argument, right, It had, has been abused in history. That's what the notion diluted refers to. Now, he advocates for popular sovereignty and the need for convention. Um, uh, well, the argument is that individual express only individual interest and therefore the general will is not the will of a, uh, not simply the sum total of individ individual wills. He is a methodological collectivist, right? Uh, 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 as I already pointed out. And then it comes to the lawgiver. Well, uh, it is the lawgiver 
who is actually can inspire what he calls amour proper. You need a lawgiver, he sees himself as a lawgiver, who actually will be able to tell you why your selfishness is no good, why the love of your country and the community is the right thing to go. Okay, and a good government um, um, means a popularly elected legislature, um, and the executive is still by an aristocracy, uh, by the wise man. That's what he really means by aristocracy. An intellectual aristocracy who is elected. Now, we have somewhat this notion, right, that people in government should be smart, right? And we have a bit of concern uh, with, you know, in the past there were some presidents in the United States, some people in the United States so they are not all that smart, right? I don't want to name names, but you can think probably of some, right? Uh, who, by some people thought they are a little on the dumb side, right? And they did not earn real much respect, right? By those who think they are not smart. Anyway, that's it. So, legitimate rule. Uh, well, legitimate rule cannot be based on natural title, that aristocracy has to be um, uh, authorized by consent. Um, well, I leave the, the family issue. That's, uh, family, he said, is the only natural society. Um, uh, but he said even the family does not come simply from nature, there is a social contract in the family, and in fact, you, when, you, when you grow up, uh, uh, you know, when you are not a small child anymore, then you will realize how much of a contract it is. Eventually, I mean, I hope there is nobody in this room, but I suspect there are probably uh, a very few who at one point thought enough was enough, you know, my mother and father is really a pain, and therefore I don't want to do much with them. Did break the contract, right? It does happen to some people in their life. As a father, I hope it would never happen, but unfortunately it occasionally does. Uh, when people are teenagers, that's when you're beginning to think about the natural right of the family, right, as a contract, right? And you're beginning to enter or some people begin to enter some kind of a, a new relationship in the parents and try to convert the natural dependence on parents on a contractual relationship, right? Uh, saying, what, uh, what do you mean I have to be back home by 11 p.m., right? You remember that? Anybody ever questioned that, uh, right? And try to negotiate it out. Oh, not 11, you want to me 1 a.m., right? Uh, I am already 16 or 17, you know? Um, that's when you are converting natural, right? Okay, uh, now there is a transition from state of nature to the nature of civil society, right? Uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, uh, that is, uh, the transition from the state of nature to civil society is necessary. This is a remarkable change, right? Uh, uh, you substitute justice for instinct uh, of contact um, uh, with morality, which was lacking previously in the state of nature. Um, and in civil society, you know, we deprive ourselves from some of the advantages that we enjoyed in the state of nature. Nevertheless, this is a great progress, what has to be taken on. We will see this also in Emil. Uh, well, uh, the second theme is about the question of diluted justice. And he said, you know, the order uh, to admit justice among us has to be diluted. 
and diluted means, you know, uh, our individual sense of justice has to be overruled by the general will. And the sovereign uh, needs no guarantor, uh, and the individuals will have to be rest, uh, constrained, otherwise they are in trouble. Um, and here, um, uh, here is the argument why the individual will have to uh, constrain. Uh, individuals cannot just follow their self-interest because the general will uh, have to uh, prevail. The common good has to overrule the selfish individual interest. A very different type of argument from the British liberals. Uh, then he argues for popular sovereignty, and he's the first who do so. Um, and this is his single most important uh, 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 contribution, right? And this has to be based on a convention, and the convention has to be arrived at by the rule of the majority. Um, uh, there must be an assembly of people, right? And, and this is also a very radical, controversial argument that they must pool the resources. It is almost a communist idea of having common property of major resources. Very problematic argument. Uh, and he also makes this interesting claim that in the state of nature, they are, they are not equal, that's a very different view from Hobbes, but we are being made equal by convention, what we uh, 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 do with each other. And the problem is, this is really, does it lead to a totalitarianism? He's also advocating for public possessions as a superior form of possession, a state, possession over uh, resources, very problematic argument, again paves the foundation towards Marxism and communist ideologies. Um, and uh, well, uh, many of the, you know, all the citations will be on the internet so you can read it much more carefully than you can do it now. Now, then we arrive at the idea of the general will. Individual, this is something you believe in Adam Smith or uh, you believe in uh, the Locke. You will be very disturbed. Individual express only private interest, so there must be a public interest. Um, and the general will is sort of, uh, it's unclear where it is coming from, but it is certainly coming over um, and above uh, the individuals. Uh, and this is the, uh, the general will, which is represented in what we call uh, the commonwealth, right? The federal authority, the federal interest expresses the general will. It is not the will of all, it is the will which serves the interest of everybody, rather than the view of everybody. Um, well, as I said, you know, there is an element of truth to it. Uh, in discussion sections, we will can talk about this. The class will be divided, whether this is uh, acceptable or not. But those of you who believe in methodological collectivism will have to take very seriously the idea of general will. And now comes the question of the lawgivers. And this is a very important argument. Well, we are only free when we obey the law, right? The freedom is uh, under self-imposed law. Uh, they, uh, uh, Hegel said that uh, freedom uh, uh, is uh, 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 you are free uh, when you uh, recognize necessity. And therefore, uh, you will have to uh, go by the law, and this will inspire uh, amour proper, uh, the love of the country, rather than amour de soi, which is self-love. 
he makes right this distinction. I am afraid I will have to come back to this uh, 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 Tuesday. I will have to leave it now. Um, uh, the distinction between amour proper and amour de soi is a very important distinction, and I have to elaborate on this uh, uh, Tuesday. So I will come back uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, social contract before we go on to ML.